Okay, officially recording. Okay, so 9.32, we're calling the meeting to order. Uh, first thing on the agenda is the approval of minutes. Can I have a motion to approve the minutes from January 8th, 2021? You all should have gotten a copy. Motion. I'll second. Okay, Maggie and Tori, okay, great. Um, there weren't, I don't believe any additions to the agenda. I didn't get any, so. Get any either. <laughs> okay. Officer reports, I have nothing, <laughs> except that I'm getting my second vaccine today, if anyone cares. <laughs> I've already said that. <laughs> Oh, and thank you, Belinda. If everyone could just type in their name Ooh, hey. and library at some point today for yeah. roll Thanks, call. <laughs> Sorry, Bob. I forgot to mention that. I always forget that too. Um, is Karen here? Karen from Glenview? She's our vice chair. I don't think she's here quite yet. Okay. Uh, and our secretary, anything to report? Nothing to report. Okay, thanks. All right, CCS staff reports. Okay. What do you have? Um, I'll, I'll go first, Deb, if that's okay. Um, so just have a couple things. Uh, first is just a brief update on the 6.7 upgrade. So as you probably have likely seen in the weekly newsletters or if you've heard during um, one of the training sessions, we're not able to set a date quite yet for the production database upgrade to 6.7. So there's a potential bug related to um, item record updates that may impact um, system performance. So we just kind of need to figure that out before we upgrade our production database. Um, so Innovative is, they're on it. Um, they're currently researching like the scope of the issue, um, the root cause and uh, fixes for that. So until then, um, our production database will not be upgraded. Um, you know, whenever we have information, we'll share it to uh, the CCS eNews um, and we will definitely give staff at least uh, two weeks advance notice before we do any kind of upgrade. So um, in the meantime, the training database is currently upgraded to version 6.7. So staff can definitely check it out um, and test out some new features, which includes uh, generating print notices in Leap, which will be very exciting mm. when, we, uh, when we have that in production. So, you know, feel free to log on in and uh, try it out if you want. Um, we do have um, documentation posted on the learning portal um, and it is, uh, and anything that's related to the 6.7 upgrade is tagged with a new for 6.7, um, uh, has a 6.7 tag on it. So you can visually pick it out. Um, so we'll let you know when we get word on the 6.7 upgrade. Mm -hmm. um, the other update I have is related to the change in Rails quarantine. So um, everyone saw on Wednesday, Rails announced they'll be ending quarantine requirement for materials sent through delivery, uh, effective Monday, April 12th. So at this time, we don't have any information besides what was posted in their announcement. Um, as CCS is following the Rails quarantine recommendation, libraries may stop quarantining returned items starting April 12th. Um, at that time, you can also opt to continue to quarantine. Um, at this time, we also are not going to make any changes to overdue notice schedules because governing board will be discussing quarantine at their meeting on Wednesday. Um, so after that, we will have more direction on what will happen with quarantine and related settings like notices from that point forward. So um, we will definitely make sure staff are aware of any updates um, and ch changes ahead of when they're actually input. Um, we'll send updates to the CERC listserv and, uh, and then post anything on the CCS uh, weekly e-news. Um, so that being said, governing board is meeting on Wednesday. Um, if you have any considerations, concerns, or points of discussion you would like them to be aware of, please, 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 please tell your directors or whoever is representing your library at next week's meeting um, so that is part of the discussion. So it's kind of like a non-update update right there, but for both of those points, it's basically stay tuned and we'll get you more information later. <laughs> Okay. Um, so that's what I have, that Deborah. That's all for me. I'm not sure if Deborah has anything she wants to mention. Okay. We'll give just one quick update. Um, 
We shared in a recent CCS news um, that we have updated our monthly patron maintenance criteria to remove um, inactive patrons from the database. So I just wanted to bring this to the group because some of you might have missed it in CCS News. Um, but previously, since we have been live on Polaris, we've been purging patrons from the database based on a last activity day of three or more years ago and an expiration day of three or more years ago. So we realized recently that that was incorrect and did not match with our CCS policy. So our governing board policy says that we will remove patrons from the database monthly based on a last activity date of three or more years ago, not anything to do with expiration date, um, which is an important distinction to note because a lot of cart libraries no longer have expiration dates for their cards. So we have updated our monthly patron maintenance query to look again, specifically at a patron last activity date and not look at expiration date when considering patrons to remove from the database, which means that we have a lot of lot more patrons than we normally do to remove from the database um, every month. So you will see an increase in the number of patron accounts for your library that are being removed um, in March, April, and then May. We have a bit of a backlog to catch up on, um, so we have more patrons to purge over these next few months, and then we'll settle back down into normal numbers um, after May. So just a heads up, if you look at your monthly report and you're like, whoa, why are all these patrons being deleted? Um, it's because we were not purging per our policy. Um, we have corrected that mistake now, and we are going to be aligning with our, our actual policy. So you'll see just a, a slight slash big increase in the number of patrons purged um, the March to May span. So don't be alarmed. Your, your staff aren't like deleting patrons in bulk. It's CCS. We are doing that. Um, and you can expect to see those higher numbers through May. <laughs> Tori says, bring it on. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll get the database nice and tidy. Um, and then again, just all cleaned up. And then you'll start to see those numbers go back down in June. That was it for me. Okay. Deborah, I have a quick oh. question. This is Jenny from Gray's Lake. We're yeah. still having trouble with the missing part check and giving us the wrong patron uh, data. Is that still an issue that you guys are working on or the yeah. Polaris is working on? That is actually, yeah, so that is a bug in our current version of 6.5. And so what Jenny's referring to is that when you use missing part check-in, it displays not the last patient, but like the previous patron. Um, so everything else works fine. Like the correct patron gets the notice, the correct patron has a claim on their account. It's just a display issue. Um, it's unfortunately not going to be fixed in our current version, but it is fixed in the 6.7 version. So as soon as we upgrade, the bug will go away. Okay, great, thank you. Um, how many people are using that feature? Well, we started using it right away because we didn't know we weren't supposed to use it. <laughs> to be honest. No, I was just curious if anybody else was using it at all. See, display and sand is up. Zion Benton, I think, is using yeah. it. We started using it about a month ago or so and noticed that weird glitchy thing. But, mm. but it's good because now like, it's on the same report as the, the claims. Right. Um, so we can see all of it and try to fix it all. Thank you. <laughs> and Palatine's like Ginny. We didn't know we couldn't use it, so we started using it right away. <laughs> and you were, you were never restricted from using it. It's, it was always there. It was something that we hadn't put documentation together for yet. So you guys are just brave jumping right in, that's all. <laughs> So, okay, so we'll move on. Um, I don't believe there's any old business. Okay. And under new business, back to Deborah for a report, uh, an update on Vega. Excellent. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. So give me just one moment to get that set up. Okay, I hope you can see my PowerPoint, Mika. Can I just have like a thumbs up? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yep. We're good. Excellent. 
So, <clears throat> excuse me. So CCS announced in December that we had signed on as development partners for Innovative's Vega Discover product. So today I wanted to provide an introduction and an overview of Vega Discover and walk you through what our participation as development partners means for all of you. So what is Vega? Vega is a new platform that is currently in development from Innovative. When Vega is completed, it will be made up of multiple um, solutions, including a discovery or catalog interface, various patron engagement tools, including a chat bot and email marketing services, an analytics or reporting software, and then program creation and event registrations piece as well. So here's a visual of like the Vega development plan. So you'll see here, um, it's kind of a clunky image. I'm sorry, it comes from Innovative. I swear I didn't build this myself. Um, you'll see the various components across the top of this graphic. Um, and these pieces include, again, the Discover component, which is the catalog interface that patrons would use, interact and promote features. And again, that would include um, like that chat, email marketing, ways that you would communicate either individually or sort of in mass with your patrons, a patron um, program and event registration piece, the analyze um, component, which would be reporting data analysis um, service. And then we have this underlying connect piece, which is the underlying infrastructure that would connect all of the various um, solutions that make up Vega together so that they interact and work with each other. So Vega will overlay um, or work with both Sierra and Polaris ILS. So Vega is an additional piece that would work on top of our existing Polaris database. So when finished, um, Vega will be more than just a catalog interface, but the discovery piece is the first component of Vega that Innovative is working on. So CCS has signed on to be a development partner for specifically for Vega Discover, so specifically for that catalog component of Vega. So as development partners, CCS, we're going to be pretty busy uh, over the next six to 10 months, um, we'll participate in advisory discussions with Innovative and with other development partners. We'll get a Vega instance and we'll begin beta testing the product with both staff and with patrons. As we go along, we'll share our feedback with Innovative um, and ultimately if at the end of this multi-month project, we feel and governing board feels that our needs are met by Vega Discover, we will adopt it as our, our replacement for PowerPack. So we have a better sense of what Vega is all about. Um, I'm gonna play a short video from Innovative that will kind of provide a, a little preview of what Vega looks like. What if your library could become a part of your patron's life in the same way they experience other parts of the modern digital world? What if you could deliver an experience that brings the virtual library to life, that builds excitement and keeps them curious and interested from wherever they are? Welcome to Vega Discover, the first release in a new ultra-modern platform that helps your patrons interact with the library's resources like never before. So what makes Vega Discover different? Well, it's in the way Vega uses a whole new level of interconnectivity and intelligence, turning basic library functions into compelling new experiences. Experiences that make your patrons feel heard and understood. Take Vega Discover's rollups, for instance. These rollups efficiently combine formats and editions quickly in one single search. So a patron can see your entire offering of books, audiobooks, DVDs, even direct access to eBooks, all at a single glance. What's more, they can instantly use the smart placehold button to reserve a title, or two, or 10. And with the click of a button, they can check out their desired items right there within their search. Natural explorers will love creating their own collections with Vega Discover's personalized bookshelf. It's modern, 
easy to find, and always present on screen. And the bookshelf gives users a handy place to save selected titles for later. Not to mention a great place to save the searches they already personally tailored to their needs. One of the best parts? Vega Discover features dynamic showcases that transform what once was traditional search and retrieve. Because these showcases are built on linked data, which means patrons can uncover all kinds of content from a specific author they enjoy, or reveal related topics they had never considered before. It works seamlessly together to create a leading-edge experience your patrons expect and deserve. And it's just the beginning for the ultra-modern Vega platform. Learn how you can unlock the potential of your library with Vega Discover and create a journey of delight that keeps patrons coming back for more. To find out more about the Vega Discover experience, visit www.iii.com slash products slash Vega today. I hope you guys could hear that. <laughs> Excellent. So that video provides a, a very basic overview of Vega. And since this video was um, put out by Innovative, they have developed a lot of really cool features that I think everyone will be very excited about. Let's move to my next slide. Whoa. What if you're going to watch it again? All right. So where are we at with the Vega program. So as I mentioned earlier, Vega is a product in progress. It is not finished yet and Innovative is actively working to develop the software. Innovative rolls out updates either once or twice a month. So like it's, it's constantly new features are being added, it's being improved, they're taking feedback and incorporating um, that feedback into the development of the product. So Vega Discover is currently in general availability for Sierra standalone partners. Sierra is the other ILS that, that Innovative offers in addition to Polaris. Um, it's primarily used by public and academic libraries as well. So there are only three libraries right now that are currently live on the new Vega product. And I've linked to two of them here and I'm gonna pop those links into the chat as well afterwards so that you can take a look and poke around if you'd like. So Innovative is currently building Vega for Polaris standalone and Polaris consortium partners. We are one of only six consortium partners for Vega at this time across the country. And we are only one of two Polaris consortium customers. Um, and the other is Pinnacle, who are our Polaris consortium neighbors down in Joliet. So we are part of an elite crew here um, of Polaris consortium development partners. So let's talk a little bit about what the timeline looks like for this project. I divided the project roughly into three phases, project kickoff and planning, early access and soft launch, and then general availability and tentative go live. Hmm. So we're currently in the very, very early stages of the project planning and kickoff. During this time, the CCS team is attending development partner meetings with Innovative. And during the, these meetings, Innovative demos new, um, new software uh, pieces. They gather our feedback, ask us questions and how we want things to work. So that's great. It's a really nice opportunity to forget for us to get in there and say this does or doesn't work for us. During this time, we're also working to establish our blockers or our, like our must-have for going live on Vega Discover. So what are the features and the pieces that we would absolutely need to have in order to move away from PowerPack? I'm also currently working with our team at CCS to develop, to develop a user testing plan for patrons because, of course, we need to make sure that the product is easy for them to use and that they can accomplish all of their needs um, and their important tasks in the new interface. During this time, we're also working to build our plans for gathering feedback from all of you because we want to know what you think about the new product as well. Now, beginning next month, CCS will also plan to recruit beta libraries for our soft launch phase, which I'll talk a little bit more um, about on the next slide. 
we'll start our initial push to create our training and our documentation for all of you. Um, and while we're working on all of these things and you know, staying very busy, the innovative development team will continue to actively build Vega for Polaris and for consortial partners. All right, so then things get really exciting this summer, which would, as we move into phase two, which we would call early access or our soft launch phase. So during this phase, CCS will receive a Vega instance that will be syncing against our production environment. So it's going to be a live Vega instance that's going to be run simultaneously or parallel to PowerPack. Once we have this Vega instance, um, Innovative will host an introductory webinar for all of us so that you have the chance to see a live demo of the product and also ask them any questions that you might have directly. During this phase, we'll begin our testing full force. Um, we'll work with all of you and with Innovative to test, to troubleshoot bugs and potential issues. And then we'll also begin testing with patrons in late summer or early fall with the help of our beta libraries. Our beta libraries will begin using Vega at their OPACs within the library as part of user testing. And of course, CCS will continue to attend um, small meetings with um, the Vega development team and all of the other consortia library partners. Okay. Then in late fall, we will move into the last phase of the project, which would be Polaris general availability. Now, general availability, it means that Vega is ready to be adopted as a primary discovery or catalog interface because all of the core functionality is there. However, it doesn't mean that Vega is done. So Innovative will continue throughout this whole pro pro um, product timeline to roll out product updates on a monthly basis. So we'll continue to test and evaluate um, those new releases um, in this phase. At the end of this phase, governing board will vote on whether CCS would want to adopt Vega as our primary discovery solution, replacing PowerPack. So governing board um, has begun to have initial discussions about Vega rollout this month. As Mika mentioned, they meet next week. So they'll begin talking about what we, if we are to move to Vega, what we would want that rollout to look like. And they'll continue to work with CCS at their subsequent meetings throughout the next fiscal year to determine our requirements for moving to Vega. All right. Um, if you want to learn more, as I mentioned earlier, there are three libraries that are currently live um, on Vega Discover. One of them is the Ferguson Library, and the link is here. I'll go ahead and I'll pop the link into that chat so you guys have that handy. Um, Innovative also has a webinar that you can look at. It's publicly and freely available. So if you want um, to get a little bit more information and a little bit more um, background on what Discover will look like, you can watch that webinar. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, in Innovative will be hosting a webinar for all of us just for CCS libraries that will happen sometime in June or July. So we'll share that information in CCS News. So, I know there's probably some questions, so I'm ready to answer them. <laughs> you can either unmute yourself or pop them in the chat. Or maybe there's no questions. Deborah, I did notice on one of the options in the video, it gave a link to Amazon for purchase. Was that just, um, you know, as libraries and Amazon just wondered what the thought process was or if that was just for a look? You know, I think, I don't know if that was for purchase. That might have been for an e-content checkout, um, but I'd have was. to go back. I'd have to go back and watch the video more in detail. Um, so there will be e-content integration in Vega, just as there is in PowerPack, in which right. patrons can actually check out um, their OverDrive eBooks right from the catalog. Um, in the video, one thing that is really cool about Vega and a really awesome feature is the, the format rollups so that when you're searching for a title, you know, maybe the latest James Patterson book, you would have sort of one display in the hit list for that title with different tabs for each format so that your whole, you know, hit list isn't taken up by the different formats. So I, I'm pretty sure in the video it was showing an example of what it would look like if you checked out the ebook and had to go to Amazon to get the Kindle format. Thank you. Yeah, I went to the Ferguson library and it actually connected me right to my Canopy app on my phone. So it was, it just kind of synced right in. So I just saw Amazon and you know, it's Amazon, but I know that we have Kindles. Thank you. 
Yeah, I haven't heard them talk at all about like any sort of like purchase this title if you don't own, but we'll have to, we'll learn more, I think, in the coming months. Okay, thanks, Deborah. Yeah, uh, there's one question in the chat from Jeff of Morton Grove. He's asking, would Vita libraries only have Vega available like in the library? Um, right now, I think that is our plan um, that Vega libraries would just like replace PowerPack at OPAX with the new Vega discovery. That way there's the opportunity to watch patrons and interact with patrons as they're using it and sort of gather feedback in that capacity. Um, governing board will be talking at their April meeting next week on whether when we're actually, if they vote to decide to adopt Discover, whether we all move forward as a consortia or if we would allow a library by library rollout. So those are gonna be some initial discussions that will be happening today. But again, the official rollout or replacement of PowerPack would not happen for almost a full year from now, um, sometime in early spring next year. Okay, no more questions for Deborah. Looks cool to me. I think so. I'm excited about it. <laughs> okay, Kim. Kim from Wellmet. Hi, everyone. Um, I just wasn't quite sure if any libraries had had experience with um, Governor Pritzker's June 20th um, statute regarding um, the library cards for underserved and underserved minors, the cards for Kids Act, student success cards, um, which are basically if you're, if there's a non, I believe from reading some frequently asked questions and best practices that were given to me, that it's for people who live in possibly an unincorporated area, but need to um, have access for children, minors that meet specific requirements for, Basically, is anyone? You, it's 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 a very confusing and long. <laughs> Miko and I were going back and forth. Um, yeah, if anyone has any has any feedback, um, I don't know that this is going to be helpful feedback, but I do want to tell you that. Um, so, Displains has been looking into this, um, and we have two areas of Displains addresses that are unincorporated that would actually have to purchase cards at Elk Grove Village. Um, the two areas are trailer parks. So we're assuming, perhaps not um, accurately, but assuming that um, the, the students that live in these trailer parks would qualify for free or reduced lunch, which is what the requirement is in order to get the card. Um, what's weird for us is that the elementary schools um, that these kids go to are in Elk Grove. The middle school is in Des Plaines and the high school is in Elk Grove. So if you read the law, that doesn't help you at all because it's super vague and weird. And if you read best practices and what other people are doing, it's also confusing. But at this point, we're going back and forth between perhaps Elk Grove is just going to give access to everything or we're going to end up giving access to the middle schoolers which seems problematic like I want to give a card to anybody who can't get a card like part of me is like they show up here I can we just give them the card but I don't know so we're we're in the midst of conversation but it is confusing because they live in an unincorporated they go to school sometimes in one city and then sometimes the other city and regardless I just want to give these kids who don't have access to anything um, the cards for the duration of their schooling. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of in the midst of, I don't know, but that's what we've figured out so far. One thing, um, one thing I did hear is that if there are questions about service areas, because it does get weird with like library districts versus schools, um, to check in with Rails, because they may have more insight since um, about service areas. Um, I'm also real quick going to drop a link to um, the Rails uh, page on underserved populations um, because there was, I, Kim mentioned it, a document from Joliet Public Library 
that was um, like FAQs and best practices. And it was incredibly well put together. So um, I just want to make sure I get people linked there in case they wanted to see that. Chris at Zion, did you want to say something? Yeah, we, we have a student card that we offer to kids. It's the length of the school year. They can only check out books and five of them, but they also can access all of the, like our online resources and all that kind of stuff using the card. And it's like for kids that, you know, mom and dad won't bring them to the library to get a card. Um, our uh, school, our school librarian liaison, she's been really helpful. She's, she started a, uh, a letter and she's reached out to the schools like using like a little gift basket saying, hey, come get a, you know, your kids can get a library card. And then through our website, now we've set up a page where they can go on and mom and dad can fill it out. And then it gets emailed to me and then I just send them a card. Great. Anybody else? Uh, I was gonna say here at Highland Park, um, are the two nearby school districts, 112 and 113, both include parts of Highwood. And we ended up coming up with a digital e-resource card because there were requests from the teachers at the schools like, hey, we wanna take advantage of some of these digital resources, but there's a split in our classes between children who live in Highland Park and children who live in Highwood. And Highwood Public Library doesn't have the same digital, level of digital e-resources that we did. So we created specific cards that just access those things, don't, can't check out any physical materials of any sort that run the length of the school year. And we went ahead, got the information regarding which students were Highland Park students, in which case we went to check and see, hey, do you already have a library card? In which case, we'll just go ahead and renew it or remind you or get you that card number. And for the students who specifically lived in Highwood, here you go. We'll go ahead and give you one of these digital e-resource cards. Like we've got a slate of 500 numbers ready to go. I think we've only used right now upwards of 40. I think the first batch were used for those in like grade to middle school. And we just got our first request from the high school for a project just this week. And we're starting to put that, that together. That's great. I didn't even realize there was a library in Highwood. There is like, uh, <laughs> it's a decent, I walked there once cause I was just like, all right. And it's about like an hour walk, but it's there. Mm. It's nice. Nice. Okay, I guess we'll move on thank to, you. Uh, sure, Kim, thank you. Uh, Mieko. Yay. <laughs> so you guys, this is our last meeting of the fiscal year, which is crazy to think about. Um, and as a result, it's time to elect our next round of officers. Uh, so we have two outgoing officers, Anne and Carrie, and um, like round of applause, they've done an incredibly fabulous job. Um, <laughs> this year and uh yeah and I'm, I'm pretty sure you led our very first ever like the very first ever formal technical meeting <laughs> virtual technical meeting so yeah. I'm gonna just put that on my um put that I have? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> something I don't know put that on your LinkedIn right <laughs> there you um, go <laughs> so uh you know a huge thank you a huge thank you to both of them um sure. their their 10 years are up at the end of June. Um, and so at that time, Karen Key, who is our current vice chair slash chair elect is going to step into chair position. Um, so that means we have two open positions to fill for this next fiscal year. Um, and that will run from July uh, 1st of this year through the end of June in 2022. Um, and so these positions are vice chair and then chair slash chair elect and secretary. Um, so secretary is a one-year appointment and your duties are to take notes during the meeting and compile the meeting minutes. Um, vice chair slash chair elect is essentially a two-year appointment. So you'll serve uh, this next fiscal year, you will serve as vice chair um, and your main duty is then to fill in if the chair is absent. Um, and then the following fiscal year, um, so that will be July 2022 to June 2023, uh, you will then assume position of chair. 
Um, so I'm going to turn this back over to Anne. Uh, we can do <laughs> nominations for each position. Um, and then we'll, I guess we'll, we'll need to do a motion and a second for, for each one as well. Okay, uh, so, oh, so <clears throat> is there, a, do I do either for, does it matter which one I do first? Whichever, whichever one you want to okay. do first. It's all new to me. I know. <laughs> do we have any nominations for secretary for the fiscal year 21-22 for the CCS circulation technical group? I'll that was pretty it. official, right? I'll do it. I'll do it if there's no one who wants to do it. I haven't done it. A spot for a while so it's probably my turn to step up <laughs> and Tori it's been said in the past Mieko can attest this is the best time to be the secretary because I you get to <laughs> you get to be like what was said a hundred percent yes <laughs> I haven't done anything in a while so I'll, I'll do secretary this time unless somebody really wants it then feel free but I'm gonna guess I'm fine with this <laughs> I make a motion, if that's correct, for Tori to be secretary. I'll second. Great. Thanks. Thank you, Tori. That's awesome. Okay. That was so easy. Now, <laughs> can I have a mo uh, nominations for the vice chair, chair elect for the fiscal year 21 22 for the circulation technical group meeting, CCS? I would like to nominate Erin McKinney. She's not here today, but. Oh boy, can we do yeah. that? <laughs> is that allowed? <laughs> it, it is because she did confirm that she uh, was interested, so. Oh, great. Erin McKinney from? Northbrook. Northbrook. From Northbrook, okay. So are there any other nominations? Okay, so what now I need a motion to approve Erin McKinney from Northbrook as our new uh, Maggie motioned. I saw her hand go up. And Lisa, Lisa from, I don't know where Lisa McHenry. Okay, wow, that was so awesome. I was thinking that it was, was gonna be hard. Right? <laughs> I was sort of nervous about this all week. <laughs> You know, well, thank you all for making it easy. It's always easy when they're not at the meeting. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's true. But, you know. <laughs> no, that's great. You guys all, it'll be great. perfect. Okay, so got that checked off. Okay, so now this is, um, I just wanted to share my screen really quickly. I just wanted to remind everybody. Um, okay, so can you all see my screen with the Rails tickets? Just nod if you can. Okay, so I'm from Prospect Heights and our, our library code is PHK. These two items should have gone to PAK at Palatine. We get about um, 10 or so of these maybe every other day. Um, so just please remind your staff to be a little more clear on the, on the tickets because these do look like PHK, but they actually should say PAK. It's just my own little personal thing. Um, and I've got a, a chat from Tiffany that GRK and GCK get mixed up all the time as well. Yeah. MUK and MK and McHenry get mixed up all the time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So just like take that extra half a second to make it clear. Um, Ooh. Rosa if, says they bought stamps. If you ever get any from Round Lake, you let me know and I'll make them stamp it because I did purchase stamps for everybody and they all decided, no, we're going to write it. Well, they so you have stamps it. for every single library? We have stamps for, well, maybe not the newer libraries like um, Grays Lake and Palatine, but, and, but I would be more than happy to purchase them. But the team decided they'd rather write it in. So if you get any from Round Lake that are like that, you let me know. They'll be stamped. I will let you know, Maggie. Thank you. Okay. I'm on it. <laughs> How embarrassing. One is from Park Ridge, so I'll make sure. <laughs> well, and I'm an equal opportunity complainer, because you see, I put one from Park Ridge and one from Evanston. So <laughs> I don't want to blame any one individual. Um, okay, great. Well, so, you know. Yeah, sorry um, about that. <laughs> that's, you know, it happens. So 
So my next thing is I'm wondering, if, so if your library, when your library gives out new library cards, do you give any other kind of stuff to your patrons? I mean, what do you include with the library card? I'm just putting, oh great, what is it? Um, we have folders that our graphics persons put together. Mm -hmm. We have um, this month's newsletter. We have um, information. We have like a little post-it thing in there with our logo on it. We have a little coaster with our logo on it. We have general information about our maker space. We put things that are, have to do with in the library. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I saw this on the agenda and I meant to take a folder home with me, but I did not. Um, but there, yeah, I can, I'd be happy to send you a photo. Oh, I'd love just, it. Just basic information. Um, mm -hmm. Actually, I'll, I'll throw one in um, Rails. They won't mind, right, if I slide a folder in for you. But, um, but yeah, it has a lot of good stuff. We use it specifically at CERC to mm -hmm. um, when we issue people cards. I write on that that pad their password. Like, here's your password because oh, we, we have people we have people go to Patreon right away, so it it forces them to open it. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? So. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, they're very popular. We go through a lot of them. Um, and we just issue them to brand new card holders, not, you know, adjusted people. Right. But yeah. Okay. Rosa? Yeah, we do the same thing. We give them out at Cirque. It's a bag. Um, basically, like you said, um, I am on, right? Yeah, okay. You are. Um, we give out, like, like you said, we give out the newsletter. We give out um, library notices so they know when things are due back. We'll give them pens, pencils, stuff like that. We have these little brochure pockets um, that have information regarding everything possible in the library, notices, services, resources, how to register, how to reserve material. There's a lot of basic information in there for them. And then just little things like we change, we change our swag throughout the year, you know, depending on what's going on, like during the pandemic, um, as, as we open back up, we bought the pens for um, touching the screens and stuff like that. We gave out rulers, just a lot of little things, bookmarks, mm -hmm. I guess that stuff like that. Just a lot of strange things. I think this is a, a lid for a pop can or something. I'm not really <laughs> sure what it is. But, and then like uh, paper clips in the Entrail logo, paper clips. So they changed the swag throughout yeah. the year. So yeah. and the bags too. Great. Great. Yeah. That's super helpful. Anybody else? Any I other? I just wanted Michelle? to, yeah, um, well, I'm kind of embarrassed. We don't give out nearly as cool stuff as um, Indian Trails, <laughs> which, by the way, is my home library, and I feel like, huh, I don't, I want to go back and, but I already have cards, so it's too bad. Anyway, what I wanted to say is that one thing that we give out that wasn't mentioned is a coupon for one free item from the Friends book sale, which kind mm. of gets people like, oh, there's a book sale back here, like, because we have the ongoing book sale. Um, so that kind of is fun because it, somebody can go get a free item, but then it reminds them, hey, there's this thing back here. I'm going to go check next time and kind of um, gets the information out there that it, that's mm -hmm. available. That's a good idea. We don't have a friends group anymore, so we don't have a book sale, but it's a good idea. Good idea. <laughs> Anybody else? And, and yes. at Lake Villa, we also give for the kids, we have a separate little backpack. Yep. With our oh. logo on so we have an adult bag and then a kid's bag and throughout right. the past year we bought a whole bunch of cute little masks so they get a mask and a bag to yeah. put their their stuff in and they can pick what mask they want and oh nice that's been exciting yeah great well you guys have such good ideas and okay. uh, this is grace like sometimes we have a coupon for a free 3d print that's limited but oh that's a good idea yeah for the kids 3D print. Okay. I'm going to just steal all these ideas. Yeah. We'll, we'll be giving away a small suitcase full of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, at Park, we have a mailer that goes out like for people who move in. Like, it, it's a picture of a giant Hershey bar. And if they bring it in and register for their card, they get the giant Hershey bar, which <laughs> I love. Because it has a specific <laughs> wrapping that says it comes from the library and it says read on one side. That's and the other side, idea. it claims to have no calories. And I'm like, Okay, this is the greatest Hershey bar of all. Uh, that is a great Hershey bar. That's a really good, that's a cute idea. I like that. Okay. Well, thank you everybody for answering my question. Oh, and okay, I have one more question. I sort of filled the agenda this, this month. Um, the libraries who have RFID, do your staff typically open up the CDs and the DVDs before you throw them in the blue bins? 
You're yep. they're all supposed to, right? Okay. Yep. Yes. Lori, it displays. Yeah, we do. We open them up. You know, the sorter will match them, but what it won't do is look inside and see if someone has filled out a damaged item slip. And so, yes, we snap them open really quickly just to make sure there's no writing on the damaged item slip and no obvious smears of food or anything on the actual DVD. Close them right back up, feed them in the sorter. Okay. Because we've gotten a couple that have been empty. So just, you know, putting it out there. <laughs> Remind your staff to mm -hmm. open them because we don't have RFID. So. And that's all for me today. Michael, I think you're back. It's my turn. Um, let me get a, uh, I'm gonna share my screen for this part. Uh, and to Anne's previous question, we have a handful of yeses from uh, Winneka, from Morton Grove, from Park Ridge and from Highland Park for for checking things. Okay, I am going to share my screen now. You're gonna be so sick of me talking here soon. Um, and play from beginning. Whoops. Okay. So what, um, I've got a few things I'm going to talk about. The first thing is another plug for getting involved in this next fiscal year, uh, which is our advisory groups. Um, so advisory, it's, it's something relatively new. We've been doing it uh, for the past three years or so. So I think there are still some like questions about like, what does an advisory group do? And like, what are the expectations? Um, so I just wanted to spend a few minutes to kind of go over what that all is and means. Um, so it, um, Advisor groups, again, just like the, the officers, now that we're coming to the end of the fiscal year, we're preparing to gather nominations for next fiscal year's advisory groups. And what the advisory groups essentially do is they act as consultants. So they discuss and consult with CCS on topics um, that relate to like potential system configuration changes or shared practices. Um, they help us out with testing and reviewing documentation. And they give recommendations on policy changes and best practices to their associated technical groups. Um, so some of the things that the Circulation and Interlibrary Loan Advisory Group will be working on in the coming year um, includes like potential notice revisions along with the user experience group. And also, you know, as Deborah mentioned, um, like consulting on helping test out things related to the Vega platform. In terms of time commitments, um, the advisory group, they meet four times per year. Um, at this time, you know, our meetings are virtual. I'm not sure when we'd go back to in-person meetings. And uh, in between meetings, we also may consult with each other over email. Um, and the appointment will run from July 1st, 2021 through the end of June, 2022. Um, so there's a couple different advisory groups that circulation staff can participate in. Uh, the first one is, of course, the Circulation and Interlibrary Loan Advisory Group, which is comprised of, guess what, CERC and ILL staff. Um, and it discusses topics relevant to those service areas and then provides recommendations to the technical groups. Um, the next group that CERC staff can participate in uh, is the User Experience Advisory Group. And this is a cross-departmental group, um, and it's made up of members from different service areas. Um, and this group is kind of cool. It looks at topics related to patron-facing services. Um, so it's heavily focused on the online catalog. Um, and it, it's also uh, right now kind of diving into a, uh, a project related to notices. Um, and then the third group that CERC staff can potentially participate in is the Database Management Advisor Group, which is um, it's another cross-departmental group. And this group discusses and evaluates requests for new policies, such as like new material types. Um, so, you know, th several different ways that you can lend your voice to an advisory group. Um, we do have a page on the learning portal that has some information on like this year's, this current year's advisory group, along with a brief like FAQ about what the groups are and do. Um, so we'll be seeking nominations for the groups in May. So uh, please watch out for more information starting next month. Um, if you are interested, uh, definitely let your directors know. Um, interested staff can self-nominate or directors can nominate on behalf of their library. Um, all participants must have director approval though. 
Um, it's a great way to get involved. Um, you can add it to your, you know, add it to your resume if you want. And, you know, I'm not biased or anything, but um, the, the CERC ILL advisory group tends to have some like really fantastic discussions. Uh, so definitely something to keep in mind if you are interested. So um, I guess any questions on, let me stop sharing my screen here. Any questions on advisory groups? Sorry that, <clears throat> sorry, I skipped that on the oh, agenda. Not, yeah, go on. It's, it's <laughs> not. Um, if you do have questions, um, you know, feel free to reach out to me directly uh, and I can, you know, I can give you some more information, um, show you some old agendas or minutes if you kind of want to get an idea. Okay, it does not appear there are any questions. Did you have one other thing, Mieko? Oh, you had I two had, more things. I had a couple more things. things. <laughs> okay, sure, go ahead. This one's kind of fun. Um, I guess I'm going to just share my screen again. Uh, so the next thing I want to go over here um, is a little, a very informal cleanup project. So, like there's no, no solid start or end date to this. It's just like, hey, if you've got time, something to check out. Um, this is cleaning up users who have a notification option of none in their record. Uh, this setting is found in the patron registration work form under the notification settings section. Um, so with this project, two-step project, uh, what you'll do is use web reports to identify users who have a notification option of none, and then you'll go into the record and update their notice preference to either print, phone, or email, whatever your library's preference is. Um, before I go into web reports and show you what to look for, um, I just want to take a moment and review why this is a cleanup project and um, why it's good to like take a look at this data. Um, and the big reason to clean this data up is so that items progress to lost. So users who have a notice preference of none will not have any notices generated for them. And why that's a potential problem is because when Polaris is generating overdue and bill notices, it takes a quick look to see what the last notice was that the patron received. And it uses that information to determine what notice to send to the patron next. So for example, if Polaris sees that a first overdue notice was already generated for the patron, it then knows to send a second overdue notice. Um, if it sees that a patron has received all three overdue notices, it <coughs> knows to generate a bill for the patron. And once the bill notice is generated, bless you, it then flips the <laughs> it then flips the item status to lost. So basically, if the overdue and billing notices aren't generated, that item status doesn't flip to lost, and the item just kind of remains forever overdue. So users with a notification option of none will never have their items progress to lost. Um, and because reading and listening about notices is so much fun, uh, I have. Um, links here to other uh, more in-depth information about notices. Uh, one is a page on the learning portal and the other is a short dedicated um, formal training course all about notices that uh, Deborah put together over the summer. Um, so they're there if you'd like to immerse yourself in notices even more. Um, but let's get to the fun part, um, that web report. Uh, so there is a web report available that I generates a list of users who have a notification option of none. Um, this is actually more of a tool than a report because it doesn't, it's not an Excel. You'll, we'll see, we'll see in a moment. Um, you can find this under statistics section in web reports and it's called monthly record counts by patron characteristics. Um, so I'm just gonna back out of my slideshow and pop into web reports. Um, Zion was the last one I logged into, so I promise I'm not picking on you. Everyone has these. And I, I'm just going to show you what the web report looks like right now. So in web reports, what you want to do, just uh, hang, uh, head down to your statistics section and scroll down to the report titled Monthly Record Counts by Patron Characteristics. Um, it's right here. It's uh, labeled as a non-Excel report because when I click on it, it opens in a new tab 
And what this tool does is it gives you a count report of users who are registered to your library based on certain data in the patron's record. Um, so for example, you can, if I click on uh, patron code, I can see a breakdown of um, how many users uh, are registered to Zion, like under you know, limited use patron code or under special use patron code. Um, the option at the very top here is called delivery option, which is a reference to the notice delivery format. Um, and you'll see there's data at both the branch level and the library level. Uh, so for multi-branch libraries, um, this does either allow you to see your data all at once by selecting a library option, or view data just for a specific branch by selecting one of your branch options. Um, for everyone else who's a single building library, uh, the data is gonna be the same between the two options. Uh, so let me click on delivery option here for Zion. Um, and again, it gives you a count of how many patrons receive like email notices versus a phone notice versus text messaging. Um, and you may see here, see an entry for blank. And this indicates that the patron has a notification option of none. So if you see that, uh, what you'll want to do is just click on the entry and it's going to pull up a list of patrons. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and click it so you can see, we can see what it looks like. If you're watching the recording, um, this is going to be blurred out so you can't see patron information. But let me click on blank. And what that does is it generates a list. Um, so then you can, it, it, it does have their barcode in there. So you can just like copy and paste the user's barcode into Leap and then change that none to like print or change that none to phone or email, whatever your preference is. Um, so that is the project. Like I said, it's, um, it's very small cleanup project, uh, nothing formal, um, but it's a good thing to check out every so often uh, just to see if there's a patron in there that may have may have um, been configured with none. Um, this count report it does update monthly, um, so it runs uh, and updates at the first of every month. So I'm just gonna stop sharing my screen. I see there's a chat. Um, Cool. Yeah, so if anyone does have like questions about um, questions about the report or, you know, uh, notices, um, always feel free to reach out to me or email help at ccslib.org. Um, it's a cool, handy little tool. Miko, should we rerun a print notice in the client after we change the notifications in case so that way it gets sent notifications or is it you can, you can just, um, no, it will. That's a good question. Uh, if the patron is like, is at a timing where they will receive a notice, um, something will be generated for them. That's up to you if you want to run the notice job like in the middle of the day, or if you just want to wait until the next day. I mean, if, you know, okay. if the patron's been none for like a year, what's another day going to hurt, I guess, right? <laughs> but one, one thing to check, one thing to be aware of, and I'm glad you brought this up, um, is that what you may encounter, um, uh, let's say this patron does have something that should have gone build. Uh, what you will encounter is that like, the, um, after you change it, the next time you run the overdue notice, they'll get the first one then the following day when you run the, the print notices again, they'll get their second overdue notice. And so, you know, it'll just be like an accelerated schedule for them. Um, but if you do print, you know, then it's the library's call on if you want to mail like all three notices to them all at once or, or you know, if you just want to do one. Okay. Any other questions for Miyako on that? Just thank you for talking about this today, Miyako, because I looked at it right after that uh, bite-sized webinar and I was pleased that there weren't <laughs> more. <laughs> so I was, I was glad, I was like, all right, not too bad. But um, yeah, mm -hmm. that, was, yeah. that was nice to see. So thank you. Yeah, well, I'm, Carrie, I'm glad you brought the question up at the, at the mm -hmm. webinar. It's something I hadn't thought about, but <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I would say like you probably aren't going to run into a lot, um, a lot of these types of patrons at your library, um, and probably run into a, like 
a good amount of like in-house use cards as none. And then you can, you know, do with those as you wish. But. Okay. And your last item, Mieko? Yeah, this one's a fun one here. Um, I know some of you are already familiar with this. Some others might not be. So I apologize if you're getting some uh, repeat information here. Uh, so I'm gonna go back to my slides. Um, so the last thing I wanted to talk about at this meeting is the National Change of Address or NCOA group submission. Um, so starting this year, CCS will be coordinating an annual group submission to UNIQUE's National Change of Address or NCOA uh, service. Um, participation in this group submission is entirely optional. Um, so what I wanted to do today was just kind of give a very brief overview of what the service is, uh, what the group submission entails, and where to find more detailed information. Um, so a little bit about the National Change of Address Service. Um, I know most of you are familiar with this. Uh, I will definitely keep it short. So the USPS maintains a national change of address database for users who have moved and submitted their new address to the post office. Um, so basically what happens is Unique will take a file of patron records and run it through the USPS and COA database. And by doing this, uh, they can compare addresses and see who in that patron file has moved and who still resides at the same location. Um, so by having this information, oh, and I'm already behind on my slides. Um, by having this information, like who has moved and who has not, um, this gives libraries the opportunity to streamline some card services. So for libraries who cards do expire, this can give you the opportunity to extend users' expiration dates without them having to come into the library and show proof of address. For libraries who offer non-expiring cards, um, the service allows you to see who may have moved away. And then you can like block their card or add a note if you need to verify their address. Um, so kind of going over what this process looks like. First, if you're interested in participating, open a help desk ticket. And through this ticket, uh, CCS will work with the library to determine which patrons you want to send and what updates you want to see at the end. Um, and then after we've got that figured out, CCS will create the patron file for submission to Unique. Um, the library will be able to preview the file uh, before it's formally submitted, um, just so there's no surprises. And then um, CCS will send the file to Unique and Unique will run the file through the database and return the updated file to CCS. Um, Unique is, is pretty fast with this. Uh, they say their turnaround time is typically one week, which is pretty impressive. Um, and once CCS has the file back, we'll post it to web reports so the library can view. And then at that time, the library will review the page and file and work with outlier accounts as needed. Um, an example of this, like maybe users who say have a like PO box on file instead of home, home address with USPS, um, and I'm sure a lot of little oddities that may appear. Uh, but libraries will have a full 60 days to review the page and file um, from the point that it's posted to uh, web reports. And then after the library is all done reviewing the file, CCS will perform the bulk updates. And um, this can include one or more of the following. So you can have the patron expiration date and address check date extended for users who have not moved. Um, for users who have moved, we can add a specific block to the patron record. And Bob has this fantastic process he created that will add the user's new address to the record. Um, their old address will still be in there. So now you've got the old address and the new address on file to view. Um, and for any patron that is bulk aid updated through this project, uh, they will have a non-blocking note added to their record, indicating that they were reviewed through NCOA. Um, and then finally, you know, if needed, uh, libraries can inform patron of the changes. So, you know, it would be up to your library if you also wanted to put out like a marketing message about card extensions or whatnot. Um, in terms of cost, uh, Unique currently charges one and a half cent per patron record submitted. 
Um, and to put that into some perspective, if you submit 2,000 patrons, that's $30. Um, if you submit 10,000 patrons, that comes out to $150. Um, so uh, CCS will um, invoice libraries only for the patron records you submit. And I also want to mention at this point that non-CCS patrons, um, so like Chicago patrons or Skokie patrons, um, those non-CCS reciprocal borrowers will not be eligible for this submission. It is just cooperative computer services patrons. Um, again, this is going to be an optional service. Um, so we'll, we're going to be doing a group submission now every year. Um, so if you're not interested in participating this year, but would like to plan on participating next year, you totally can. Um, if you want to participate this year and then don't feel the need to participate next year, that's okay. Uh, so by joining in this year, you are not tied to joining in every single subsequent year. Um, in terms of this year's timeline, if you are interested in participating, um, open a help desk ticket by May 12th. Um, so that's kind of like our deadline to submit intent to participate. And um, that's just so CCS has enough time to compile the patron records. Our target submission date to UNIQUE is May 26th, which means we should have the uh, completed patron data back from UNIQUE in early June of this year. Um, so after that, libraries would have 60 days to review the returned data. Um, and if you are interested in more information, um, you know, please visit the learning portal. Uh, we have a page that gives a brief overview of the project along with um, an FAQ. Uh, plus there's a very detailed document linked in there. Uh, the page can be found uh, in the public services procedure page under the record maintenance subsection. Um, we're also hosting an informational webinar uh, on April 28th at 10 a.m. Um, you can find the registration for that on L2. Um, all of these links will be available in today's CCS e-news. Uh, so when you get the newsletter this afternoon, um, you'll see all of these links in there. Um, and I will definitely make sure to get Carrie uh, the links uh, for the minutes too. So that is a very quick nutshell overview, I guess, of the INCOA project. Um, so I'm going to back out and stop sharing my screen and see what questions and chats. So Mieko, it did sound like that will happen after the patron purge that's going on, right? Yes, okay. yeah. Um, um, I, have yeah. I have a, um, my director had already gotten an email about this and submitted it saying, yes, we're interested. Do I still need to open up the help desk ticket? I'll, I'll open it up and I'll just include all the information for you right away. Okay. Well. Um, I see, um, oh, Michelle's got a question. Um, this might be in the documentation that you've mentioned um, that I haven't looked at yet, but I just was wondering if there's best practices in terms of we get somebody's address back and for instance, they move to Mount Prospect. Do I have to block them or can I delete them? Mm -hmm. um, and, and then, okay, you're in displays, but you're still in displays, but you have a different address. I feel like, okay, I can change those up. That's not a big deal. But like the people that move, I don't want to keep a bunch of records that are wrong, honestly. I just want to, I want my database to be clean finally. And it's been a long road. I don't have a recommended practice for you. Um, I don't know if... I know there's some other libraries in here who have kind of recently gone through this. If you want to talk to what, um, talk to your experience and what you found worked for your library. We're going through it now with um, Wilmette. So Michelle, basically what we did, if they moved out of district of the library and not into a CCS library, we looked at their last activity date and if most of them, you'd be surprised, it's been some time. So if their last activity date did not fall within, I think it was 2020, we just deleted the card. 
for those that moved to CCS, we updated their CCS address as a secondary address and put a blocking note on their card. And we expired the card for 1121 to give it, because no one's open that day, to kind of flag staff that this is an expired card. Um, for dual property, it was a little bit harder. Um, if they were currently using their card, I honestly looked at, I went on Google to see if they sold their house recently. Um, I know that there are some websites that allow you Cook County assessors to see who currently resides in that house. But I also just looked up their address in Leap to see if another family moved in. So um, there were a lot of steps that we took to kind of mitigate it. Plus the training server was always there if I needed to recreate a card for a patron. The bad part is, I didn't have the reading history if they maintained it, but there's only a handful of patrons who do um, and that I've seen come across. Um, I, does that kind of answer your question, Michelle? That helps and I might bother you more later, but yes, thank you very much. Um, I've got some good questions in the chat. Uh, the first one asks if you have to be signed up with Unique to send patrons to collection um, in order to be a participant with NICOA, you do not. So uh, if you do not participate in collections, um, you can still participate in the group submission. Um, and then uh, first question, did any libraries update their card policies to reflect this change? That's a good question. We're doing that now because we don't have any policies for library cards. So we're doing that right now. I guess that would be, yeah, something, definitely something to uh, keep in the back of your mind if you're um, anticipating participating or running this service regularly. Um, and the other question, uh, does this create negative impact on patrons who have homes in other states or multiple properties? That is a tricky one um, because the ILS data along with the, um, the INCOA database cannot determine if a user has multiple properties. Um, so that's one of those gray areas. I um, unfortunately, from a data standpoint, there's not a way to cleanly tell that. Yeah, we have a hard time with that one in Lake Forest because we have a lot of patrons who um, are snow bunnies and spend, uh, we get a huge list of people in Arizona and Florida. So um, last activity date seems to work the best in those situations. If um, some of them were small enough, there's some of them we know already. There are a block of people who do it regularly. And well, oh, good to see you again. Oh, you're back. So it is an issue, but usually last activity date gives you a pretty strong indication of whether or not they've been, you can put a, a non-serious block on it or deal with them the next time you talk to them. But um, yeah, it's, it's sort of like Kim was saying, you kind of just, it gives you at least a place. There's certain things that are just clearly, obviously no more. So you can get that bunch out of there. And then it's easier once you narrow, you, you can determine after that how much you really want to do to the account. You're just aware. You don't have to remove it. But you've got the ability to maybe change the expiration date or something to um, talk to them sooner. So a lot depends, though, on how much they're using the card. It's really amazing how many things you look at the minute you see them. You go, oh, well, look at the last activity date they're gone. And it does at least clear quite a bit out that doesn't need to be there. So even if you choose, you're a little, you can be a little hesitant. You don't have to, they're just telling you, you don't have to do anything with it. So if it's a questionable account, I just leave the expiration date and see if they come back and they could eventually get purged under the usual purging if you're not sure. I'm done. No, that's some great insight. And um, another thing to to that point, um, if you don't want CCS to do like a blanket um, block on patron accounts, if you'd rather kind of work through them individually, um, you can. So we don't necessarily have to do 
any kind of bulk updates if you don't want to. Um, you can just kind of join the group submission to get the data back and then do with it as you, as, as would be most helpful for you. Um, I've got a couple other uh, comments in the chat. Um, Melissa asked a great question about how accurate is the non-activity date um, or the, the last activity date? Does it count patrons if they check out e-material? Um, e-material is an action, checking out e-material is an action that will update the last activity date. I am going to pop a link into chat. Um, this link will take you, oh, it's huge. Um, this link will take you to the circulation manual. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, and on page 17 of the circ manual, it lists the different activities that will modify a last activity date. Um, you can also find the circ manual on the public procedures page on the learning portal. Um, if, uh, if you don't have a link handy somewhere. Um, so yeah, it's uh, kind of like in a nutshell of what updates the last activity date. Um, let me get back there so I can uh, take a look. Um, it, it's mostly activity from the patron side of things. So it's like if they check out physical or e-content items, um, if they renew items, um, things like making a payment, uh, even logging into the, um, their online catalog. Um, those are the kind of things that are going to update that last activity date. Um, oh, and, and Jeff says that Morton Grove updated their library card policy uh, when they started the service this year. So um, I can tell people to lurk, lurk on Morton Grove's policies. <laughs> Kim. Two questions. Um, was there a reason May was chosen as the month? No particular reason. It was um, just when we were kind of ready and uh, with the timing of um, giving libraries enough time to kind of like decide and figure their data out, uh, that date seemed to work. I just wonder if it's possible to also think about um, October, just because most people have moved, if they're going to move their kids out of school districts because of the school years. So uh, that kind of leads into my next question. Typically, unique management requires uh, 50,000 patron records to kind of get that bulk rate. If we wanted to run a secondary report, are we able to piggyback on the CCS um, because it'll be over 50,000, 50,000 yeah. to run a secondary um, report later in the year. Yeah, so here's the cool thing. Oh, later in the year, I will have to check with uh, Unique on that. Um, for this group submission, that minimum is waived because we have more than one library participating. Um, so the group submission is not subject to that minimum. Um, in terms of later that year, um, I'm not sure. I will have to check on that. Okay. I just may for it's kids are still in school. So, yeah. and that's where that movement happens. So just something to think about if we only get the one time. Um, that's, or the, yeah. yeah, that is, um, you know, that's something we can always consider like going forward. If there's a different time in the year that is better for libraries to run this data. Um, we can we can certainly, yeah, evaluate when the best point for submission would be. Thank you. Making. Okay. Um, as my director would say, does anyone else have anything for the good of the cause? after every single meeting that we have with him. <laughs> I love that. Not Robin's not here, can we cheers to Robin? Sorry? Okay. Robin's not here, can we cheers to Robin? Oh, yeah, that's awesome, Robin's that's in it. position. Congratulations, Congratulations, Robin. I will definitely pass that along to her. Yeah. Thanks, Will. Thank you. So I guess we're finished here. Thank you, everybody. This has been a you know interesting, fun year for well, it hasn't really been that fun in terms of the year in general, but for for this has been fun to be able to see all you guys every so every couple of months. So thank you um, for your patience with me and my silliness. So I guess we need a motion to adjourn. Right.
before we do that, um, can I ask the um, people from Huntley really, really quick that are on this um, meeting, the, the best way to contact someone right now with their library closed? If, it's, purely, it's purely self-serving for Algonquin as we have lots of your visitors with us. Is there anybody here from Huntley? Not anymore. Oh, I thought oh, I saw somebody. Donna, Donna can't turn on her audio, unfortunately. Okay. <laughs> okay, you can you send a just send something to the chat, the best way to do it. And and that would be awesome. Sorry. Um, and continue on with the motion. Okay. So motion to adjourn. Do we know when the next meeting? No, oh, we're gonna the, the stone or board has to vote on that, so it's okay. Determined. Yeah, I forgot. Yeah, I forgot about that. Yeah, and, um, thanks for I'm glad you brought that up, Tori. Um, I forgot about that. Can in, I'm sure you know anticipate it being on our usual schedule, like second Friday in okay. July. But um, when the official when the dates become official, we'll send it out to everyone. Okay, great. Then I, um, I I move to adjourn. <laughs> You guys I'll, I'll help write that down. <laughs> I second. Okay, Tori and Karen. Great. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you.